Hello everyone, welcome to Liquid Brain. So today I want to talk about organoids, which is actually something that I recently read about and feels like it's actually a step closer for us to actually make an art artificial being. So I just want to talk about it. So just some general disclaimer before I start talking about the whole topic. I'm not very good at this, I just learned about this few days ago and I feel like it's something good to share and something like if you are uh, not familiar with, it will be interesting for you and if you are really an expert on this um, subject, maybe stay around so to make sure if I say something wrong, maybe you can put a comment down below so you know, I don't misinform people about this topic. So before we actually go into artificial organs or organoids, let's have a look, quick look on how medical studies actually works. So for example, if you have a new drug before you can actually deploy it, first is to find out what kind of compound actually works. So in order to find a certain compound that works, we actually test a lot of different compounds in uh, what we call an in vitro process where we actually test the compound in in cells in, in a glass jar, okay? So we put a compound in and we see what happens. So if it works and we kind of understand how it works, we move on to higher level and maybe we target from 100 or 1000, we target down to 10 and we move on to an animal model where we call it in vivo model where we test it maybe on a mice. If it works on a mice, maybe you test it on a rabbit. If it, has, if it works in a rabbit, maybe you test it in a chimpanzee and maybe if it works again, then we test it on humans and we, after we test a lot of different humans, we are confident that it works and then of course we launch the product to the market. Uh, there are certain shortcuts to this but you know, this is a general traditional long haul process of how do you get a, a drug to get commercialized baby. Okay, so but the, the real problem is that when you find something that works in the cell, where you work, find something that works in a jar, and you transfer to an animal model, you realize that uh, things are completely different compared to what you have previously found. Whether it's genetics data, whether it's synesthetic data between the things, and and all the other stuff. And one of the issue is that when you're trying to grow cell on a glass plate, it doesn't represent completely on how it grows inside the human body or inside the animal body. So there's a lot of things like extracellular matrix that signaling factors and all the hormones around there, I think stroma uh, structures and so on. So what we are trying to do with organoids is that we're trying to create something in the lab, which is in a glass or in a, in a jar that's more representable of an organ instead of actually just uh, growing like a uniform cell. So in 2D cells, they're always two-dimensional, means that uh, they are the same and when you look from the top down, every single cell are very similar and you group from the left to right, they're often just a single layer. Okay, so organoids are different in in the fact that they are three-dimensional. So you can actually see like a three-dimensional object inside your glass when you're doing it. So they're using something like a, a matrix or something like a gel so that the cell can actually stack on top of each other uh, much easier compared to normal two-dimensional cell culture. Okay, uh, inside the, the jar that you have, organoids often also contain different cell types uh, that can actually perform different functions and maybe they have to work together to actually uh, do a certain things, which is why they are they're different from normal cell culture in that way. And this is actually more representable of how tissue functions or how cell function in their novel environment where we actually have a, um, they, they actually do what they're supposed to do instead of trying to adapt to the culture or the artificial culture that you give to them. Okay, some brief history of how this had worked. This is not exactly a new idea and they've been trying for the last hundred years. So the original concept of that actually come from 1907 where they realized that if you pluck a cell out of a sponge and you put it in a lab or some sort, it will actually grow into an entirely new organism. It will self-organize and and grow into a proper structure, okay? Based on maybe a little bit of signaling factors that is secreted by that single cell. Um, but it's a lot more harder when we're dealing with animals and, and some other stuff. So one of the biggest breakthrough is actually pluripotent stem cell, a stem cell that able to grow into multiple type. Because if you don't have that, uh, whatever you grow in the lab, is gonna be the same cell uh, all throughout. Okay, so that's in 1981, where in 1987 is that actually they're able to start to grow something three-dimensional uh, in an ECM extract, extracellular matrix extract. 
and they can actually get a little bit of differentiation of the cell within the glass in the 1987. So, and the rest, you know, uh, from 1998 onwards, they would just get more and more and more different cell types and until 2020 where we have a report of a group that actually get a snake venom gland organoids ready and expressingly highly on the toxicology functions and and the toxic producing uh, mechanism and system. Uh, the paper did not clearly say that they produce all the toxin, but they say that it's going to be really useful for toxicology studies. And one of the things that I really want to highlight is cerebral organoids from HPSC, which is actually cerebral organoids means your brain cell, and they're able to control like a different uh, growth factors and different signaling factors that you put it. It will either grow into your brain cells that are on the frontal loop or, or some other part of the cell and just by controlling the parameters around them, which I find very interesting because they also call it the, the mini brains that's inside the, the glass plate, which is amazing. So there's many, many applications of organoids. Uh, these are one of the examples given by the review paper. Okay, so what I'm really interested in because what I do most of the time is omics, which is like the transcriptomic genomics and all the other stuff, uh, in particularly, um, because you have such a different number of cells on the same plate, single cell RNA sequencing become extremely useful to understand uh, cell to cell interactions and, and the expression of different type of cells uh, within a single jar by itself. So you can get an amazing number of different information just by sequencing a single jar. And imagine you have a few jar that you can actually just um, stress it at different um, chemicals and so on and you can get actually the interaction of not just a single cell type like traditional RNA-seq but uh, sorry uh, of a single cell type pool of all the cell type pool together which is what we did in traditional RNA-seq where we pull all the sample uh, single cell RNA sequencing is able to understand how does this drug affects not just the central cell that you want to target but everything around it and does that actually and this would actually help us in understanding how to actually do more precision medication. For example, if you want your cell, to, you want your drug to only work on that single type of cell type, what can you do? And what are the things that you, you need to avoid in, in destroying the rest of the cell while destroying your cancer cell, for example. So one of the other things they talk about is actually to, to look for potential stem cell or cancer cell because they are kind of the same in some way. So uh, how can we look at the organoids and understand the, the development of it and maybe we can understand uh, for example, disease modeling is one of them as well. How does them, how do a normal, um, like a small organ develop into a cancer? What are the cells responsible for it? What are the expression that, that actually result in such, such an initiation of cancer development and so on and so forth. Uh, some other one is like regenerative, regenerative medication, uh, medicine where we actually try to regrow a, a little organ and we can actually study it so that we can either re-implant them into your body or we can actually grow something new to you by using some other people's cells and so on and so forth. I think the last one I want to talk about is um, drug discovery. Yeah, something like that. Uh, I think it's precision medication. So precision medicine, where, for example, if you have a serious disease, we can actually take one of your cancer cells out, uh, grow it as an organoid, and then test multiple different drugs onto the organoids and see how that organoid responses. And we can understand actually how to best treat your cancer using the combination of drug that we have instead of using a conventional um, one, one thing kills everyone method. And we can really give you only the drug, uh, con drug concentration, a drug type that really fits you and you only and so on. And there's, there's a multiple different things that we can do which I'm, I think I'm not qualified to talk too much in. Okay, so let's switch, I will switch on to uh, the comparison of multiple things that kind of resemble organoids, but not really. So the, the, the paper actually put uh, this four, which is the 2D cells line, which is cell lines, which is the normal cell line that I talk about, I think on, on the last five minutes and so on, where you grow a single type of cell type into a glass jar. So they are just uniform, they're the same and they're everywhere. 
Okay, so the second would be the um, organoid that we'll talk about here. So we sometimes call them uh, 3D patient-derived organoid because they're three-dimensional and we took the organoid out from the patients. Okay, so there, there can be multiple origins, but this is one of the examples that is given in the paper. So, so yeah, you take a cell or you take multiple cells from the, from the patients and you grow it as an organoid. So the next one is actually patient-derived xenograph, which is you take the whole... Um, a sub organ or something like that, a part of the a part of the cell from the patient, and you actually graft it onto uh, immunosuppressed mice. For example, you can see a heart cell uh, attached to a mouse here. So the mice is actually maintaining the 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 sub organ that is that you actually taken out from the patient previously, and you can actually do modeling on that mice. And the last one will be genetically engineered mouse model, either through knockout gene, introduction of gene, editing of gene, and so on and so forth. So in terms of cause, I would say, um, not I say, the paper say, uh, 2D cell line is tra traditionally the cheapest, with 3D patient-derived organoid slightly higher, and patient-derived xenograft uh, even higher. So for mouse model, uh, I believe it is also high, but they do not say, yeah, it's also high, but it's, 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 it's actually quite a different thing compared to the rest, where one, two, three is actually doing on human cell and mouse model is doing on mouse cell. Okay, but it's also significantly more expensive compared to the other type of uh, 2D cell line, for example. Okay, uh, but the thing is that on the 2D cells, cell line, most of the time do not represent the original environment with 3D, or 3D uh, organoid slightly more and patient derived xenograph a little bit more again and I think I spelled derived uh, wrongly. I'll fix it before I attach to the slide so when you download it's correct. So don't kill me on that. Okay, so uh, 2D will be least representable of the real environment where the cell actually grow with organoid slightly better and patient derived xenograph uh, even better. Um, but of course, with the xenograft, you're actually planting in the mice, so we're not too sure how much interaction and how much impact the, the mouse metabolism is going to have. And for genetically engineered mouse model, we don't usually compare to the other three because again, we are we're doing a completely different thing uh, on, this, on, this, uh, on this mouse again. So they don't represent the same type of research methodology, I would say. I think the last one will be scalability where uh, 2D cell line, incredibly easy to, to scale, where you can just send a tube from to the other country and they can restart their whole lab based on the single tube that you send. Uh, the other two, not that easy, especially patient-derived, where you actually have to take the, take the organs from the patients and you know, uh, try to graph it in. There's a lot of surgical procedure involved and you know, there's a lot of protocol mismatch where different people do it different way and we don't know if one works for another or not, okay? So same with patient-derived xenograft, it's more like a surgery rather than a research method. So it's also really dependent on the people that run experiment. And genetically engineered mouse model, completely unscalable. You have to do it yourself and you have to do it one by one. We can't, uh, most of the genetically engineered mouse I don't think they can reproduce and if they can reproduce i don't think we want them to so they're not scalable at all and last one for uh personalized personalized medicine i talked about precision medicine just now it is possible to take a cell from the patient and graph it as a organoid or as a xenograph and actually study it um an outside of the owner outside of the donor and see if we can actually detail or tailor make a certain drug for them. Uh, but 2D cell line, very difficult because most of the time when you take things out of the cell, uh, you lost a lot of cell functionality. They don't have a stroma environment and it's really difficult to know exactly what will happen if we actually test the kind of uh, the drug that works on the cell line and it might not work works on a human and so on. And for the last one is genetically engineered mouse model. Most of the time, we're not looking at, let's say, a single person, but rather we're looking at a single gene or single drug type or single interaction or single pathway. So uh, the last one is mouse model, not really applicable for personalized medicine and so on. Okay, so there's some comparison. So how do we go forward with this organoid technology? So the first thing is to connect basic research and precision medication uh, medicine. So what the owner wants to happen is that they don't want... Um, Okay, I, I'm paraphrasing here. I'm not sure that's what they want, but it's what I read in the article. So they want to connect basic research and precision medication. So they don't want basic research to do 
all the way on whatever they want and most of the time they're not applicable on the back end so they're trying to bring the two closer together so what we're doing in research can be more applicable in the clinical sense in a much faster or much uh, in a much faster way and much more directly linked to one of another so maybe within like uh, a year or two years we're able to bring things to market uh, even the best case scenario that we have which is COVID-19 it's kind of a national international emergency it, it always takes us like a year to make a vaccine and it could be faster with if we actually popularize and establish this organoid technology and which is the one we're going to say the next one, which is standardization of protocols. Uh, we have to have a common way to do a certain diet of, of, of cell. If every single cell in every single lab requires a different protocols and it doesn't work if you don't follow them, it's, it's really hard. And we're running into a replication crisis again where we, know, we, we don't know if we can trust the paper or the technology or not. Okay, so the next one will be tumor heterogeneity, tumor heterogeneity for long prong culture. I don't know how to pronounce that word. So what they are trying to say is that when you grow a tumor as an organoid in the cell plate, uh, we don't know how long we can maintain the original structure, original expression, original mechanism of the tumor, especially after you have cultured it, subcultured it multiple times. It might change from the original culture and and we, we don't know what have changed and we don't have not. Especially when you have multiple cell type now, it is even harder to, to backtrace what have changed. Um, and yeah, the complexity might just not, might, might make the whole thing not worth it anymore. Okay, so comebacks for quad cell, it's maybe not that scalable. Okay, so the last one they want to do, I think in the far future, is to combine things like organ on a chip, where organ on a chip is kind of like, a, uh, you can think of it like a microarray chip, where you can put drugs in and then see how an organ responds and, and make possibly make like an artificial organ on a piece of glass so that whatever you want to test it, you just put it on it and it will give you the expression, it will give you the reaction and you can immediately understand what does the drug do to a certain organ uh, and you can do it multiple times, hundred over and over hundreds and thousands of different drugs in a very easy manner, okay? Which is actually, yeah, it's part of the microfluidic studies in as microorganisms on a chip. That's what they're trying to say. So um, just to recap everything, what is organoids? It's kind of a artificial organs that are slightly more complicated than 2D culture, but um, less complicated than actually growing a real organ. So it's, it's some sort of things that are in between and which I find it a very interesting way to describe it as a step closer for us to actually make a Frankenstein monster, which is like an artificial being. Uh, I think we're still a long way to go, but you know, we already have mini brains growing in the lab. So maybe not as far as we imagine. So that's all I want to say for today. Thank you for listening and we'll see you in the next video. Bye.